Hi, uh, good afternoon everyone and uh, thanks very much. Uh, it's really cool to be here at Facebook London and uh, to everyone else joining me from around the world, uh, it's really fun to be able to talk to you via live broadcast. Uh, I'm a big fan of live broadcasting. Um, so why am I here? Well, uh, my name's Daniel Hughes. I, I live here in London and for two and a half years the Everest Million campaign completely consumed my life. It was a big battle to try and raise as much money as possible for comic relief. And I just thought I'd start off with the campaign video to hopefully uh, get your juices flowing and give you a little insight as to what I got up to. So how did the Everest Million campaign start? Well, um, I had the typical honeymoon. I have basically spent three months on an adventure truck in South America. For me, it was paradise. For my wife, she was expecting a nice beach holiday. But uh, we're in the, the mining town of a place called Potosi, which is one of the highest cities in the world. And children like this guy here basically have a really bleak future. They grow up, they end up working in the mine. Within 10 or 20 years, they're either dead or they've got some really nasty disease. Uh, so I came back to the UK. And being a climber, I actually wanted to go back to Aconcagua and try and raise some money for comic relief. The idea was to try and take a red nose and put it on the top of Aconcagua and try and raise a few thousand pounds for comic relief, and I would pay for everything. It was one of those kind of Google moments in that I was on Google, and I was Googling about Aconcagua, trying to find out more information about it, and I found out that no one had ever put a red nose on top of Aconcagua before, which is actually really surprising, because Aconcagua is kind of the next thing which you might do after Kilimanjaro. It still gets down to minus 50, it's still an expedition, but it's pretty accessible. It's just a steep cramp on walking with spikes on your feet. But as it happened, actually, I did a really nice technical route called the Polis Glacier. A few weeks after that, I then found out that no one had ever put a red nose on top of Everest. And I just thought, wow, this is my big opportunity to try and raise some serious cash uh, for comic relief. Um, I'd never aspired to climb Everest. It really was something which I just kind of fell into. So I've got Everest on one hand, I've got a million pounds on the other, and that basically became my brand. It was the Everest Million campaign. And it was one red nose, one million people, one pound each. So my call to action was to try and get one pound off a million people. So in terms of climbing Everest, I put in over 20,000 pounds of our own money to pay for the training. But to climb Everest costs around about 50,000 pounds, and that's pretty much the bare minimum you're gonna to spend to climb Everest. So it's very, very expensive. But there was a couple of reasons why I needed the money. It was one, one obviously to fund the project, but also I needed the support to be able to share my story with other people as well. I needed the exposure. So the first 12 months was an absolute nightmare. It was really hard to deal with. I sent out over 200 bespoke PDFs to companies around the UK and in fact the world. I was thinking, well, how can I align what I'm doing with their brand? And for me, like for FedEx, I was going to be the red-nosed guy delivering a FedEx parcel to the top of the world, and you could then track me. So I was trying to come up with an ingenious ways to align myself, but the, the charitable as aspect of it basically wasn't enough. 
there wasn't either enough alignment with a brand or they've got, already got involvements with big charities, as a lot of big companies do. So I needed to regroup. And in a former life, I was in the Army, and one of my roles within the patrol was in communications. I'm also a big techie as well, so I started looking at, well, what can I do which is going to be different? What's going to differentiate me from, from everyone else? And for, for me, that was technology. As again, I went on Google and I found out that no one had ever done a live video broadcast from the summit of Everest. So I was like, right, maybe that's, that's what's going to differentiate me, but how am I going to do it? Well, I guess I kind of reverse engineered it in a very, very simplistic way. I was like, well, how, how can I communicate from the top of Everest? What do I actually need to be able to talk to someone? Previously, someone had managed to get a 3G signal by almost falling off the mountain, but that was never going to be good enough for a video broadcast. I needed something better. So I started looking towards uh, satellite technology, and there's a few companies out there, and very luckily for me, just two miles down the road was Inmarsat, the world's leading uh, provider of satellite data. But more importantly, in terms of the, the tech point of view, they've got geostationary satellites, which basically means that the satellites don't move. So if you have line of sight to the satellite, you're going to have a really stable connection, unlike Iridium, where actually they're constantly moving around. And actually, some of the satellites are actually dead. They don't actually work. So you could be talking to someone, and then all of a sudden, it just drops out. So what I first started off with, I went down to Mars, sat, knocked on the door, and said, look, this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to see the world's highest video broadcast. How do you fancy it? And obviously, they're absolutely delighted, because you know, here I am going to try and use their technology in the most awesome way. And, and they just threw a kit at me. They were absolutely amazing to me. Didn't have to sign for anything. They just completely trusted me and just kind of let, let me crack on, which was, which was absolutely brilliant. So I've got the ability to communicate, or so I think. Um, there's a lot more testing to come. But actually, well, now I need a kind of a platform to be able to deliver my video call. What can I use to, to make a video call? Am I going to lug like a PC or a netbook up to the top of Everest, a GoPro connected to a smartphone or, or whatever? I, I, ne I needed some sort of platform, and that platform happened to be a smartphone because it was perfect. You could do everything from it. You could use social media. You could obviously take videos. It's Wi-Fi, Skype, the whole lot. It's a personal computer in your pocket. So, so that's now what I wanted to use to be able to integrate with a satellite modem. So I've got these two ideas, got no idea if they're actually going to work, but it, it sounds kind of feasible. Um, and then that then meant that I could now try and find another sponsor to come on board. Um, I needed 50,000. Um, I was minimum looking for 40,000. And I just started looking at all the different smartphone manufacturers. And one thing I learned throughout this entire journey so far was obviously aligning what I'm doing with them and HTC smartphones happened to be running a campaign called As Recommended By. There's nothing more powerful than basically a personal recommendation, basically. Um, so I guess I kind of lucked in, really, in that I found out about their campaign. I produced all my marketing material, um, aligned around that, and then sent off to HCC, heard nothing. And then all of a sudden, I get an email basically saying, uh, the following people would like to see you. And as you do, had, had a look to see who they, who they were. And I had the head of marketing for Europe, head of marketing for the UK, head of product. I had some massive people in this, in this meeting. So I kind of knew that it was, it was mine to lose. So now it was, for me, about setting a reservation price in negotiation. So what is the minimum amount of money I want to try and walk away with? Obviously, I want their support. But if I don't get the money as well to help fund the project, then the project's dead anyway. Uh, so my number was 40,000. 40, I went into, the, went into the interview, into the meeting, and they offered me left. And in the end, I got that 40,000. So, so, so it was green light for the campaign. And more importantly, it wasn't just about the money. It was the exposure which they're going to give me, which was then going to allow me to get a lot more support from kit manufacturers and, and lots of other people as well, including the BBC. So that was a massive part of the campaign. So this is me at the BBC. So we, we got the technology and spent pretty much two years testing it. The whole kind of risk v, v reward phase. Do we, do we rush in and try and do the summit next year when actually we don't know if the technology is actually going to physically work in the conditions? And as it turns out, 
Um, someone actually tried to do it the next year and failed because they had it be <laughs> suspiciously were su supported by Samsung and they tried to take a netbook to the top and they failed. So we were right basically to take the time and develop the technologies and the software. So the next couple of years uh, were, were all about that. It was about developing my technical skills in terms of climbing. I'd already done a fair bit of climbing, but nothing in the realms of Everest or high altitude. And also about developing the technology as well. I guess Mont Blanc was a bit of a freebie in that I climbed that with my wife, but it's really fun. But I've put the picture here in that Mont Blanc, which is the highest peak in Western Europe, is 700 meters lower than base camp and Everest. So you think it's a big mountain, but it's nothing compared to what lies ahead. I did go down to Aconcagua, and this was one of the first, first stages in testing in terms of the, the satellite modems and the actual handsets. So I got to the top, put the first red nose on there. Uh, at the time, I bagged the world's highest Facebook post, uh, live, live video broadcast, and a few other bits and pieces as well. But it's very, very important, actually, because the satellite company offered different satellite modems. The one as a climber, which I took, was the smallest one. It was the lightest one. But the problems we had with it were that because it was so small, it had to be exposed to the elements, which then meant technical reliability issues were a big, big problem. Uh, and also the bandwidth wasn't as good as, as the larger satellite modems. So, so that was a really good learning point uh, for me in terms of like learning about altitude and temperatures, but more importantly, getting the satellite kit as well. Then went to Scotland, um, did some great climbing up Ben Nevis, started to integrate satellite phones into the project. So from this, I could basically send a text message, uh, which would then go via if this, then that, which would then distribute amongst our social media networks, which is uh, really cool. Uh, and also I started to integrate spot trackers as well, which had just come out. So tracking where we move just to see, see how well these will actually pick up my movement. The next climb was Denali in Alaska, and this place is crazy. It, it kind of blows your mind. It gets down to minus 89 in the winter. In the summer when we were there, it was minus 50 and beyond. It's a wild, wild place. Um, it's actually technically the highest climb in terms of vertical meters in the world. You get on this plane, as you probably saw in the, um, the little promo video, you land on the ice with a sled, and they say goodbye to you for three weeks. Nothing lives. Um, and every night you'd have to set an alarm clock to dig out the snow from your tent, otherwise you'd suffocate because of all the amount of snow drift and snow which were coming along. So Denali was uh, the next stage in testing in terms of the equipment, so I took a much, much bigger satellite modem. With this one, you could put the antenna outside of the tent, and, and, I, and I literally left it there for days, because at one point we got stuck in the same place for 11 days. Just threw it outside there, all the internals were inside, it had Wi-Fi, and then I was then playing with different handsets, whether it had Android, Microsoft on there, and seeing how the different cameras, i.e. front-facing, rear-facing camera, would, would be better for Skype. Because actually, um, although it's nice to have a 12 megapixel camera, the compression was then causing issues in, term, in terms of Skype. It was, it was making it harder for Skype to deliver the best possible picture. So Denali uh, undoubtedly is a wild, wild place, and I didn't actually get to the summit. As I said before, the, the weather was so crazy. People were digging through the bottoms of their tents, literally preparing themselves to lie, die when we were there. And it's one of the most dangerous years in over 20 years, um, where actually uh, one day we actually walked over eight dead bodies without, without even knowing it, some Japanese climbers. So crazy place. Uh, this is a little promo, promo picture. Don't, don't recommend this. This is kind of like minus 40 exposing skin. It's everything basically which you shouldn't be doing. So this is kind of like June 2012. Um, by this point, the tech testing is going really well, although the BBC weren't involved, weren't fully involved yet. Um, but things have really started happening. Um, I'm very persistent, and basically, even though someone said no, I would still phone them back six months later. And uh, after 18 months of um, phoning people like Coldplay, uh, eventually they kind of gave in, basically. I think they realised that it's going to be easier to give me global rights, all their music, than to, to have me keeping phone, phoning them up. Uh, so I ended up getting some great sponsors from Gateway, Coldplay. Fortunately, Facebook Live didn't, start, uh, didn't actually physically exist back then. Um, so I had live stream to do live streams into my Facebook page and loads of other guys as well. 
So from a climbing point of view, I guess that that kind of journey is kind of, it's done. Um, I've done a lot of testing with a kit, which I, which I had. Um, we've still got a lot of tech testing with the BBC, and in fact, I worked with the BBC for over nine months, going out to television house, um, working out how best to communicate with the BBC, whether it's through Skype, Google Talk, there's Quick Links and loads of other software packages as well. So we were very, very comprehensive with our testing. There's no doubt about that. But actually, we haven't actually done the most important bit yet, and that was to start fundraising and to get people really aware of what I'm actually doing. Um, as much as I, I asked my mates, well, do you mind just sort of donating 1,600 quid each? And well, that's, that's a million quid. Uh, but that didn't really go down well. So, so I had to try and get a pound off a, mi a million people. And obviously, I don't know a million people. Uh, a million people don't know me either. Um, so I needed people to get to know me. I wanted people to get to know me uh, and then feel that it's important to me and to hopefully donate and hopefully to share my journey with others and to click that magic like button and all that sort of good stuff. So this is where we started building up the social media campaign, and undoubtedly Facebook was an important part of that. I did a series of uh, unadvisable events, basically, uh, leading, up to, <laughs> leading up to Everest. Uh, and, and this was one of them, uh, running in all the kit, which you see there, uh, in the middle of the summer. So uh, I did a 10K, basically, in all my Everest kit. Uh, and you were just kind of running past St. John's ambulance, and they are just going, what are you doing, silly boy? And, and yeah, sure enough, like for days afterwards, I, I, I felt hot. So I, I probably, probably did myself some, some damage, but um, any bit of exposure was important. Any, any way to get people sharing it and all that sort of good stuff was important. So that was, that was the Nike 10K. Uh, the next one, inspired by the, the London Olympics, uh, when they streamed the Olympic torch, uh, I managed to convince VW to give us vehicles uh, on top of the car, there's a satellite modem, which then linked into a bit of kit made by Quicklinks, which basically you can merge eight SIM cards, pull all that data together, and before you know it, you've got broadca broadcast grade um, quality. And I had 29 other riders riding with me, from Olympians to all sorts of weird and wonderful people, uh, going from the west coast to the east coast uh, of the UK in three days. Uh, the longest day was 186 miles from Taunton to Comp Garden and uh, we caused chaos on the A4. They, they weren't, weren't particularly happy with us, but, uh, but we got through it. Uh, so I'm making a picture of my feet. Uh, did an event called the Spine Challenger, which is uh, the year before only one person had finished the Spine Challenger. It's in the winter, it's along the Pennine Way, and uh, it's minus 10, and it was absolutely terrible. Um, it was the first time, actually, where I had to walk away from something. And that was really hard, actually, because you know, being a bit of a nor guy, you know, I'm never going to give up. But actually, I had to consider what the implications were ahead of this. Now, I got to 80 miles, I was hobbling. Is this worth it? This is just a small part of that cog. And actually, I probably walked on 10 miles too far, to be perfectly honest. I should have given up earlier. But being pig-headed, I carried on, and eventually, yeah, uh, I, I, I gave in. So let's talk about Everest. Um, it's 8,848 8, meters high. Um, it's first summited by legends in 1953 by Hilary Tenzing, Hilary and uh, Sherpa Tenzing. Um, I went by the South Coal, you can go via Tibet too. Uh, 63 days it takes to climb Everest. It's a, it's a really long time. Um, it's 99% boredom, 1% excitement, and the 1% excitement is really, really dangerous. Um, summits over 3,000. One in 20 people die on Everest. Um, it's not the most technical climb in the world, uh, but the objective dangers are very real. And the average temperature on the top is minus 35 degrees. Put that in perspective, your, your fridge freezes is like minus 16. So it's pretty chilly, and that's without any wind. As soon as any wind comes through, you're into the minus 50s, and now you're trying to stop things falling off. It gets pretty, pretty sporty. Um, I just want to show you this video. It's such a cool video. This, so, so this is um, from 1953. And every time I watch this video, and I've watched it a lot, um, it still puts the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Once there was a mountain called Peak 15. Nothing was known about it. But in 1852, the surveyors found it was the highest in the world. And they named it Everest.
when men were first drawn to Everest, it was an unknown quantity. Something entirely beyond them. Excuse me. I don't really know what happened there. Okay. Cool. Uh, so I hope you, hope you enjoyed that video. So uh, we've been trying to climb Everest for over over a hundred years, and, and, it, and it, 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 it wasn't through lack of trying. It was actually because the science wasn't there. That, that's pretty much why we couldn't get to the top of Everest. Um, because they didn't understand the science of jet streams. They didn't understand the science of weather. And also, they were climbing from the Tibetan side, and literally, they had to have hundreds of Sherpas, and over 100 Sherpas, every expedition would die, um, because they were climbing the wrong seasons, and, and climbing from the south side then opened up a different, a different way to climb Everest. And, and in the 1950s, when they had a better understanding about the weather and the oxygen systems, that's what, that's what gave them that breakthrough. It, it really was science. Um, so you get to Kathmandu, which is a crazy, frenetic place, and uh, you get on this tiny aeroplane, which two weeks before they had lost two of them in the hills. So that's that's really good fun. Uh, and you go up to this place called Lakla, um, which which used to be a gravel, but in, in essence, it's the it's the world's highest um, and most dangerous um, airport. Um, it's a very 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 dangerous place. Uh, so you, that's kind of your gateway to the Everest um, base camp trail. Really cool, I, I reached out to the Royal uh, Geographic Society and they gave me access to all the 1953 footage. So it was, it was an absolute privilege to be there really because 
it was the 60th anniversary of the first summit. So I was getting kind of to follow in the footsteps of, of heroes, uh, of legends, and also getting to compare my journey with theirs. So this is in 1953, uh, and that's in 2013. So actually, not much had changed. People were still having to carry all the stuff which climbers need, which as someone who's trying to raise money to help people in poverty, I really struggle with that actually, because I'm trying to help people, not actually have them or see people hurting or sweating or you know, in pain basically because of me. Um, so that was actually quite difficult to deal with. Um, and you see lots of awesome kids throughout loads of red noses. It, it was a really fun adventure getting to base camp. And we deliberately take longer than most base camp track, tra uh, treks. Uh, the reason being is we want to get to base camp in the best possible shape. Um, acclimatisation takes a really long time. Uh, in essence, uh, altitude sickness derives from pH levels being out of kilter, not having enough oxygen pressure and all that sort of stuff. So taking your time to fully acclimatise was very important, but also to enjoy the beauty. The, the funny thing about the Everest base camp um, trek is that actually you spend more time looking at that mountain, which is Amber Dablam, than you, than you do Everest. Uh, very famous sign you see, if you put in Everest and Google, you'll see this straight away. Um, and then you finally get to a base camp. So no one lives here. Why, why would you want to live here normally? It, you are literally on a moving glacier. Um, it gets very, very cold. And for some reason, all us climbers like to pitch our tents on this rocky outcrop on, on, on the glacier. And up to a thousand people basically go there for the climbing season. So this kind of village populates. And what's really cool about base camp is, is the fact that actually um, you've all got this one goal. So it doesn't matter what you do in your normal life or where you're from, you've all got this shared goal, which is actually kind of cool and really, really interesting. Um, so we've got tons and tons of kit, and this is just, this is just a very, very small amount. Uh, each of us had uh, six of these big, big duffel bags. Uh, I had all sorts of other things, comms tents and all that sort of stuff as well. So in terms of the kit, I thought I'd bring down some of the kit for you to sort of pass around and show you. Uh, so uh, this is the uh, trust, trusty ice axe. So on Everest, actually, we, we don't actually do any ice axing like that. It's not that technical, but we do do a lot of uh, using it like this, like a kind of walking stick. And the reason why there's this bit of a gaffer tape and sponge on top is because this would get really, really cold, which then make your hand cold as well. And it makes it more comfortable to hold. And if for some reason you fail, you can then do an ice axe arrest where you then plant this into the, into the ice. So be careful, it's uh, pretty sharp. Uh, the, these are the crampons. So th these are some of the climbing, climbing harnesses which, which, which we'd wear basically, and we can attach onto some, some of the ropes. Uh, solar panel gear, but most importantly are these big jackets. And, and this is just this is just kind of one layer. Underneath here, you've probably got at least another four layers. This will keep this will kind of keep you warm down to about minus 30, minus 40. And, and as I said before, once it starts going below there, uh, you, you really are just fighting to stop things drop off. The, the kit can only do so much for you, but that is kind of the, the best Everest jacket you can buy. And uh, these are the trousers. So you look like a, a big kind of Michelin man. Uh, so you, 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 you're carrying a, a lot of kit on you. It's, it's very, very heavy. Um, but basically all that stuff is gonna save your life or it's gonna keep you alive anyway. So as I mentioned, sorry. Um, at the end, if that's right, do you mind? Yeah. yeah. Um, it was a tech fest, I won't lie about it. I love technology and it, it, it was my differentiator between everyone else. Um, this, is, this is my, my comms tent. Uh, so this is, this is just one of the satellite modems. So, so this is the detachable bit here. Uh, I had two of them running in parallel, two and a half thousand dollars an hour. Uh, and I went through over a million dollars worth of satellite data on Everest. Um, even the BBC are afraid of running these things. I had a and it's all thanks very much to my sponsor. Uh, I had a dedicated channel to the satellite, especially for me, which is pretty, pretty, pretty awesome. Um, I had NAS hard drives, all sorts of bits and pieces like that. 
Um, in terms of powering my journey, I had solar panels, uh, hydrogen fuel cells, and then I also had um, a, a biodiesel generator as well to keep all my, keep all my kit running. I managed to get Astium, which are a satellite company, to take a load of satellite pictures for me. And actually, during the actual um, summit attempt, they were taking live satellite imagery for me, two and a half thousand pounds a picture, and then managed to convince a company in Munich to then take a satellite image, morph it onto a 3D model, and then you could then pan around Everest live. And then this, uh, this spot tracker would then update where I was on this, on this live satellite model. And I guess, I guess this was the real validation with the BBC. Up until this point, all the technical testing had been uh, either over in White City and then and into the new one in Portland Place. Um, but this was the real validation. So this is me speaking to the BBC News Channel uh, using exactly the same kit as I was going to use on the summit. It all went really well. And actually, the funny thing about it at the end, he said, the picture quality from you is better than we're getting live from Downing Street, just like half a mile down the road. And, and, and as, soon, as soon as I got that validation um, from that one channel, it just went bam. Everyone in the BBC wanted to speak to me, which was fantastic. And actually, I ended up doing a series of live broadcasts all the way up to the very summit, which no one had done before. Speaking to um, BBC London, News Round, B Blue Peter, The One Show. I mean, it, just, it was kind of endless, really. The requests were, were, were endless. It was great. Social media was obviously fully in action. So um, someone who basically posts me a picture or say something on Facebook, I would put their name onto the tent. This is quite early on in the campaign, but by the end, the tent was completely littered with names. I was encouraging people to try and interact with me and share it with their friends. And then another silly thing which I did, but there was a field hospital at Everest, um, some doctors from Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital were basically looking into why people with low, low oxygen saturation rates, why some people live and some people die. Um, so they're getting a lot of volunteers all up to base camp and then they have this field hospital where they then make uh, volunteers um, do a VO2 max test and you've only got half of the amount of oxygen which you'd have at sea level. And that's all because of the pressure. It's not because there's no oxygen, it's just it's all about the pressure. Uh, so I stream, stream this live as well and uh, yeah, felt the effects for quite a few days afterwards. Every, everyone in my climbing team were going, you're mad, because you spent all this time preparing for Everest. Again, why are you jeopardizing it? But I had to do everything I could to try and share my journey. It was my focus. I needed to raise that million pounds to those kids, which I saw in Bolivia. We're live from Everest. It's a bit fun. I'm here, you're gonna be able to join me at the very top of the world. So, yeah. <laughs> a, bit, a bit of fun and, and the world's highest Harlem shake. Um, but you can see there, actually, at Everest Base Camp, it's, uh, it's kind of interesting because uh, obviously your, your, your brain is programmed as to how fast, how fast you can normally move at sea level. You can run at this pace or you can walk at that pace. Uh, and you've still got that kind of hard tune in your brain, but your body disagrees massively. So you know, people are actually genuinely knackered having like dance for 30 seconds. It's, um, it's kind of fun. So how do you actually get to the top of Everest? Well, if you look at it like that, you go, oh my God. I mean, it just looks completely unnavigable. A bit like any big project which you, which you might have uh, if you look at it as a whole, often it'd be completely uh, overwhelming. Um, and as climbers, we, we, we break it down into sections, basically. Um, when Hillary and Tenzing first arrived at here at the foothills of Everest, or the, at the bottom of the icefall, which is just here, they described it as one of the most inhospitable places on Earth. They really scratched their heads as, as to how they were going to get through. Um, the, first, the first part of it is called the icefall. And if you can imagine blocks of ice the size of houses, which are constantly moving. It's a glacier which is basically being compressed from two mountains, Nupsi and, uh, Nupsi and Everest. And these blocks of ice are moving all the time. So you'll be in your tent at night, a few hours later going through the icefall and you'll hear a massive avalanche. And it freaks a lot of people out because actually there's very few places on earth where you get exposure to, to such events and, and such extremes like this. 
very, very dangerous and every year it always uh, kills people. The first stage of getting to the summit is going up to the top of the icefall and then you then come back down again. We're, we're trying to get our bodies to acclimatise, so we always climb high and sleep low. So we climb to the top of the icefall and then we come back down again and we stay, stay there for a couple of days, fill our faces full of food, even though actually eating meat is completely pointless because actually you can't absorb protein at altitude, which is really unfair because actually you want to lose fat and keep your muscle mass. So when you do finally go to the summit, you've actually lost a lot of um, muscle mass. Uh, so it's very unfair, but you keep all the fat. Um, so you then come back down again, and this is us returning uh, back down to base camp. So this is actually where the blocks are smaller uh, than at the top, um, but it looks like kind of action men. It doesn't look completely real, but yeah, that's uh, two of my teammates, Guy and Dean, coming back from the top. Uh, and then this is a little cool video. So. As you can imagine, these blocks of ice are being squeezed, compressed, broken up, and there are all these dodgy kind of Chinese B&Q ladders which are, which are lashed together. Uh, and this is me crossing one of the crevasses. So there's plenty of those and actually by the end, the actual ends of those ladders weren't even attached, so it's basically like a ladder magic carpet, um, which even though you're clipped in, uh, seems like everything's going to be alright. A lot of the ropes on Everest are, are complete placebos basically, they can be up to 50 metres in length and the, the carabiners which you have are completely loose so you can slide up and down them. Uh, with this one, yeah, it will stop you falling into there, but it's going to be an absolute nightmare getting out and it's definitely, definitely going to scare you. So you go back down to base camp, you come back up again, and then you get to the Western Coombe, which is at the top of the icefall, and then before Lotsi, the Lotsi face. It's just this really horrible, generally cold, long drag, and eventually you get to camp two, which is kind of like a bit of a, an advanced base camp. There's a, there's a very basic cook tent, and there's a toilet and stuff like that. So it's a little bit more comfortable than, than later on. You go to camp two, you then go all the way back down to base camp again, there's a bit of a theme here, and then you sit there and you then wait again for the weather to get better, and then eventually you then go up to the Lotsi face, which is a thousand vertical metres of, uh, of ice. It gets a little bit of sun in the morning, uh, and then it's in shade for the rest of it, so it's really, really slippery, and people, people die every year on it. Um, a lot of the time, actually, it's just through accidents, because um, it's actually pretty steep, as you can see, and these Sherpas basically cut a ledge into the ice for us so we can pitch our tents. So what happens is that people come out of their tent in the middle of the night to go for a pee, trip over guy, uh, one of the guy lines and then just fall, go, go for a big ski basically uh, and eventually lose their lives down the bottom. Uh, this is the satellite modem in action, so an Inmarsat big air modem. Uh, with the, you can see the cable which then goes to the inner workings inside and obviously my ice axe. So you kind of finish the, the acclimatisation phase, you then go back to base camp and now, now what you're waiting for, you're waiting for this perfect weather window. Um, normally on Everest the winds are well over 100 miles an hour, so you can never go up there that sort of, with that sort of wind, it'd be far too cold and you wouldn't be able to see anything. Uh, we're looking for winds of 20 to 30 kilometres an hour, which considering at 29,000 feet is basically nothing. Um, we're looking for this perfect weather window and using a lot of satellite imagery and satellite data to try and work out when the, the best time is to go. There is a little story actually in that I got down from that last bit of acclimatisation phase and um, Skype reached out to me via Twitter and uh, says, yeah, any chance you can give us a quick call? So, oh, fair enough. so picked up the satellite phone and gave them a quick call and they said, oh, um, we've heard that we've heard that you're doing a, a live video broadcast from the summit. It's like, right, how did you find that out? Because I, I, at that point, the exposure actually been relatively little. I told my sponsors, um, but I hadn't reached out to them. It just so happened that we were using Skype as the delivery, delivery bit of software. And they said, yeah, yeah I am. I am. I said, oh, great. Um, yeah, we've got another guy here. Is, um, he's trying to do the same thing. And I'm like, right, OK. And, um, he, but he's trying to speak to schools, and, and actually, it, it, 
it didn't bother me at all that someone's going to beat me to the summit and the kudos involved with it. It was just a platform to try and share my story. And but, so it was really, really disappointing that actually someone might do that ahead of me and then I'll get to the top and no one wants to speak to me, um, which, would, which would be a massive blow to the campaign in terms of the reach which I, which I was hoping to get from it. So I find out with this other Skype, the, the other guy who tried the year before, Kenton Cole, the prolific climber, uh, who failed the year before, I just assumed he was naturally trying to do it anyway. So I was always kind of like, here yeah, to the grindstone, trying to find out any, any information about, about him. Uh, so I find out that he, he's gone over to Nupsi. So he's climbing a different mountain at this point. I still know that he's going to climb Everest. I, I left the summit before him. So I just assume, right, he's over there. There's, he, he's out of the picture. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get to the top before him and get to, do the, get to do the video call. That's great. I don't know where the Skype guy is, but we'll just have to wait and see. So eventually I get going for the summit. And you get to Camp 2. Uh, you spend a night at Camp 2. And then you then go up to, up to uh, Camp 3, which is a lotsy face, which is over 7,000 vertical meters above sea level. Uh, in that morning, I was absolutely devastated. It, it takes a really long time to get your body going because, um, I don't know, it's just hard to oxygenate your body. It, it takes like half an hour, an hour, just literally just to start putting your legs one in front of the other. It's something, something which you just take for granted. Um, but this morning, I, I, I literally just couldn't move. I, I was, I was almost in tears. Uh, I was kind of plodding along as slow, I mean, literally like that. It was, and I, and I, just, I just couldn't move. I felt absolutely paralyzed. And I thought all this, all this preparation, all the people I'm trying to help, my sponsors, the whole lot, I'm just about to throw it all away. Um, but I just, it was, yeah, it was just one of those moments where I just kind of kept on plodding along. All my teammates had basically left me. Uh, so, so they're gone and I just kept on plodding. And, and then, I don't know whether there's some sort of divine intervention or something like that, but just something happened. And somehow I managed to regroup and I managed to get up to camp three. And uh, uh, yeah, there's a little word in here which I use a lot and that's epic. Uh, so here we are on the fixed lines. Looking down there on camp two. I can't tell you how hard it's been so far. Epic and seriously cold as well. Oh, my feet are just starting to warm up again. The sun is just starting to uh, hit us, which is nice. And uh, good job we got the old helmet on. We've been smacked by a rock, which wasn't very much fun. But yeah, just pan you up there. It's the rest of the guys. Yeah, it's just, uh, this is called the Lotsy Face. It's basically all ice and uh, oh, epic, absolutely epic. As I say, I was pretty tired. It was pretty epic. Um, but yeah, I got I got up to uh, got up to Camp Three and uh, Camp Camp Three. So you get a night there, and that's actually where you start to go on auction, albeit on a, a very very low flow rate, about half a liter a minute, and it's and it's pretty much um, just to make you that a little bit more comfortable when you're sleeping. Uh, sleeping at high altitude is an absolute nightmare. You don't sleep properly on Everest once, um, and the reason for that is, as I mentioned earlier. Um, about your pH levels being out of balance. So, uh, so your kidneys need loads of water, so you end up drinking a lot of water, but you obviously can't absorb it. So the, the standard kind of routine for sleeping is to drink as much water as possible to help your kidneys and also because there's very little ambient humidity. Um, and, and then you then put your head on the pillow, your heart is racing about a thousand miles an hour even though you're not doing anything because it's trying to oxygenate all your cells. Uh, you then fall asleep, wake up, need to go to the toilet, it's minus 30 outside, fall asleep, need another drink, wake up, toilet, and it just, it just goes on like that basically. It's an absolute nightmare. Um, and, and it's even worse as you go higher up, so a little bit of oxygen just helps you try and get that little bit more sleep. So we end up um, leaving the, lots, uh, the camp at Lotsey or the Lotsey face at five o'clock in the morning. Um, we then go up towards the yellow band and then what's called the Geneva Spur. It's called the Geneva Spur because the, the Swiss basically named it. And I was going towards the Geneva Spur 
and guess who I saw coming straight towards me? This like bright blue person. He's got Skype all over him, and I was like, <laughs> uh, so I'm like, so I'm I'm obviously dis I'm obviously disappointed, um, and and I'm now thinking, well, if he's already done it, you know, am I am I going to change my attitude to risk? Um, I'd already set with the team gates, i.e., places which are where I wanted to be. In, in terms of space and time, um, because I know the amount of pressure I was going to be under. It was going to be a huge amount of pressure to get to the summit. And by having these gates where I go, right, I want to be at a certain place by a certain time, and then what am I going to do if I don't hit it at that time? I, am I going to turn around? I would have a defined plan already in place, basically. So it just removes all that decision-making process. So I see him come towards me, and just to add insult to injury, he's like best mates with one of my teammates, uh, who's a, a legendary Antarctic um, explorer. Uh, not that he told anyone, he's got multiple records on Antarctica. Has a good old chin wag with him, I carry on plodding along, and then eventually plucked up the courage to go to Christian, my teammate, and say, hey Christian, <laughs> how do you know that guy? He's a guy called Mark Woods. And uh, I said, oh yeah, yeah, I know him, I've been on the Antarctic with him, and, uh, and I was like, did you get to the top? No, no, he didn't get to the top. He got to a place called the balcony, which is actually not that far up from, from the high camp. So now all of a sudden, I'm now re-energized. I'm like, right, okay, so, so it's back on. Um, I, you know, bit of a, if, I, if I could skip, I would be skipping up the mountain. Uh, and that, that, that sort of um, optimism lasts for about another hour, where the guy who was climbing Nazi then went streaming past me. And he's Kenton Cole, he, I'm not sure if he's now got the record for the most number of Everest summits. He's a prolific climber. Uh, I'd have no hope against him, basically. But he went straight past me. So all of a sudden, I'm now sinking down to those lows again. So it's kind of like this massive emotional roller coaster. Um, but eventually, uh, you get up to the South Cole, which is at 8,000 metres above sea level. So it's about 26,500 feet uh, above sea level. And it's a really desolate place. I mean, you can't really tell it from here, but uh, it's... It's basically in between uh, Lhotse, which is another 8,000 metre peak, and, and Everest. And the wind just whipped through there. Even when we were there, nice day, 40 miles an hour, uh, often over 100 miles an hour. And tents, equipment, and people just can't handle that sort of battering. Um, so a lot of stuff is like broken. A lot of stuff is dumped because actually people just don't want to carry it down. Um, because you spent 50 grand in your trip. Uh, and you, you, you're worried about a $400 sort of oxygen cylinder. So people do end up littering it there. So it is a bit of a state, actually, the, the high camp. So the high camp, you go out, you try and find some snow, not there's, you can, which in itself is uh, easier said than done. You end up melt, melting it. So you might get like four pots of snow. And depending on the density of the snow, you might get like a can of Coke's worth of water after like an hour of trying to boil water. It's, you know, it's so frustrating try and get some food in, and then, and then you try and get a bit of kip in as well, which is nigh on impossible because you are bricking yourself. You are just about to go into the area where all the films talk about and all the highlight, the death zone. From this point onwards, it is nigh on impossible to get you down. Um, up until here, it's possible for people to be able to carry you down. It's still very, very steep, but it's possible. Um, but no helicopter support up there, you really are on your own. And there's a bit of an unwritten rule, really, that if something happens, then people can barely look after themselves, let alone get teammates down. So very often, if you have problems, then, then that can be the end of you. And, and it could be something as simplistic as losing a glove. Um, we call it the Swiss cheese model, where you have something very small. So you lose your glove, your hand becomes cold, you're now having difficulties with your climbing gear, you're now much slower, you run out of oxygen, you become hypoxic, you die. Something like that, and, and it sounds, sounds terrible to say it like that, but, but that's, that, that's what happens. Something really innocuous can cost you your life. So you try and get a bit of kip, and then you leave, they leave the South Coal at eight o'clock. So already by, by this point, we've been up since five o'clock in the morning till eight o'clock in the evening. And, and now, now, you, now you're on the, the business end of things. Um, a lot of people were trying to summit when I did. Um, in fact, actually 80 people, including Sherpas, summited. So there was a queue. It was actually really annoying because you, you were there, you were cold, you were, you were hungry because you hadn't really eaten enough, and you were hanging on to the side of a mountain in a queue. 
Um, and it was demoralizing. You were knackered. Um, but it was when the sun came up where you suddenly thought you got kind of you got like a, the equivalent of a can of Red Bull put inside you. Um, and, and the sun came up and you just got to see all this beauty as well. So this is a really great shot. So that's the shadow of Everest. And, and Everest is, a, is very, very cool and that it, it really is that kind of like that's that mountain shape which you would expect, that kind of pyramid, uh, unlike others. And this is going up towards uh, the south summit. Uh, it's like a full summit, so you think you're at the top, but you're clearly not. Um, and that's Tundu, who's uh, the Sherpa, so he carried some of the extra oxygen for me. Uh, I was carrying 13 kilos of extra comms gear to get myself to the summit. To put it into perspective, people are like removing straps off rucksacks and everything. You carry one litre of water and a couple of Mars bars for the entire day. Um, one, because of weight, and two, because actually you're so fearful of taking your gloves off or taking your oxygen mask off and the valves and freezing that basically you end up, don't, you just don't drink enough and you don't eat enough, which is crazy because there's near zero humidity. So this is from the South Summit. Um, the South Summit is where we always change oxygen cylinders because this thing happens. Uh, it's been in the papers recently actually, that is Hillary's step. Uh, and every year people lose their lives on Hillary's step. Probably not anymore because it's, uh, it's physically gone from what, from what I was reading the paper. Um, and that is all down to poor decision making. As you can see, there's a queue. It's one up, one down, and it can take, can take about 40 minutes to get to the top, top of it, depending on how, how big the queue is. There's also a problem with it in that you're less than 100 vertical meters from the summit. So you can imagine, even myself, who've been planning it for, for two and a half years, for many people, this had been like a lifelong aspiration. They'd spent a lot of money, they'd focus a lot of time. So that kind of push on itis um, is really, really prevalent. And for me, my gate was eight o'clock by the top of Hillary's step. If I didn't reach it by eight o'clock, turn around. Simple, simple as that. But people, people don't, don't have that sort of, if you want to call it discipline, or that, you know, that process involved, process set to help manage some of the risk. And they end up pushing on, you get to the top, which is great, you get your nice photo, you come off the summit and then you die because you've got salivar edema, which is basically where your, your brain has swelled and you just can't get down quick enough. Uh, so this is at the base, base of Hillary, Hillary's step, all these like random ropes, you don't know which one to trust, some of them are good, some of them aren't. And it's, it's quite funny actually because uh, you have to use the crampon, so you front point into, into the rock. Um, but it's actually quite high up as well. So, so for, for a lanky guy like me, it's actually it's not too bad. But uh, for, for some people, it's actually really hard to get enough, to get your leg up enough. Plus, you're at like almost 9,000 meters above sea level as well. So it, it's a really hard shock where you, you're literally pulling yourself up the rock to get to the top. And eventually, uh, you get to the summit. So a really cool story, which I, I like to tell to kind of contrast mine with, with theirs. So, so this, is, this is George Lowe basically back in 1953. He's got his nice little wireless. Um, the Times have been sponsoring uh, all the, Ever Emer the Everest summits excuse me, um, for the last few years. So they had a reporter at base camp. But to get word of the first summit, they had to wait for Hillary and Tenzing to get down. They finished off the rest of the article in code. It was then run down, down the valley for 10 kilometers down to a place called Ferrache. Is then radio to an embassy in Kathmandu, run from the embassy to the British embassy, where eventually it was telegraphed in code again, back to the Queen, and then eventually the nation. Uh, now, for me, I uh, got out my satellite phone. I'm sorry. Uh, I phoned up the, the back end uh, of the BBC News channel called SCAR. Um, I then set out my satellite maiden, which actually was really difficult. And actually one thing I didn't really think about in terms of actually it needs to be on a relatively flat place. Uh, so, so I had to basically stake uh, my ice axe into it and then get Tundu, my Sherpa, to hold my oxygen bottle. It was a bit of a, you know, it, it was actually quite awkward. Extended out, extended out the phone and, and then via Skype basically started making the video call and for me, I was uh, audio in, um, but video out to try and get the best possible bandwidth. And this is what happened. Hello, you are watching BBC News. We are interrupting our scheduled programme now to take you to the live shot that we have at the top of Mount Everest, which comes to us courtesy of the British explorer Daniel Hughes. 
He has just scaled the world's highest peak. He's trying to raise money for the British charity Comic Relief. And this is a very special moment indeed, because Daniel is in vision from the very top of the mountain. He is 8,848 metres above sea level. Daniel, amazing to see you there. How do you feel? Oh, it's, uh, it's been a, a very hard 24 hours, I'll be honest. Uh, we went out from Camp Phillips, the high camp, uh, yesterday, yesterday morning, and then I've uh, literally walked for 12 hours uphill. But you're right, it's a very special day indeed, uh, for two reasons. Uh, one, because of the nose. This is the highest ever in nose, and there we go. And I stick it onto my uh, face there. I don't know if you can see that now. So that's the highest ever lead nose. I'm trying to raise a million pounds for comic relief. It's also very special because, as you can see, this is the world's highest live video call. Never been done before from the, uh, the rooftop of the world. And I'm just panning around here. Hopefully it's not too windy. So uh, just in case you were wondering, uh, I don't have a camera man with me. It's me and a pole, an HTC smartphone, and an in my sight big I'm made of. And of course, my red nose. Uh, it's a very proud moment to be here. It's uh, two and a half years in the making. Daniel, it's fantastic. Could you do us a favour? We can hear you very clearly, by the way, and the picture is fantastic. Can you pan around to give our viewers the view that you can see from the top of that mountain? Well, I've got to introduce my Sherpa here. I wouldn't be here without Tindu. He's an absolute legend. He, uh, he's been helping me for the last few days. Uh, the Sherpas, no one would get to the top of these mountains without them. So, uh, massive thank you to Tindu. And, uh, oh, just about to step in a big hole. So I'm just going to pad around now. <sighs> That's just incredible. Keep panning because it's totally fantastic to see that. Uh, so, so it, it kind of all worked out really. Uh, we we only had 494 kilobits, um, and actually, in reality, I think it probably went out a bit less than that. So the, the quality wasn't wasn't as, as good as we hoped, but 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 technically, it was a success. Uh, so I did that, and, and then obviously, the next thing on my big agenda was to do the world's highest uh, Facebook post, and uh, this is the picture which I took. Um, so, so I've actually got I actually took one of my big gloves off. Um, to, to take that photo and you can see I've got like a, a little electronic sort of thumb. Uh, I took my glove off for minutes view and by the time I put my, my glove back on it com completely iced inside. I had to basically crunch it because obviously there's some ambient moisture inside the glove. You've got three layers, you've got, you've got the inner and then you've then got two layers uh, within the glove as well. Um, so I did that, told everyone to share it and then uh, phone my mum as you do and, uh, and my wife. Uh, and that was it. I really didn't spend uh, any more time on, on the top. Um, it, it was an objective, a big shopping list. Do this, do this, do this. Raise the money, raise the money, raise the money. Get off Everest. And um, when you get to the top of these mountains, it's, um, it's a bit mad, really, because your, your guard goes down. You start thinking about all the things which actually you shouldn't be thinking about, like, uh, can I change my flight home? All, all this stuff, when actually you've still got, you're on the top of Everest and you really, really need to concentrate. So it's, it's really easy to, to, to let your thoughts run away with you and actually not be completely focused on what you're doing. And, and none more so than, than here, because the way down is undoubtedly on any mountain the most dangerous part of it. Uh, you're knackered and obviously gravity uh, is against you. Um, so um, getting down the mountain was, was a top priority. And, and when we went down Hillary, Hillary Step, if you were climbing normally on any other mountain, you'd properly abseil, you'd clip yourself in and all that sort of stuff. Everyone was using a very primitive method of abseiling where you literally wrap the rope around your hand, put it down like this, a bit like the A-team, and then you then just literally bungee or parachute down, down the rock, um, which, which, is, which is nuts because there's a 3,000 metre drop on both sides. Um, but eventually got down to the South Coal, completely broken, sat down, uh, again, no one would get to the top of Everest without the Sherpas. Literally, like a Formula One pit crew came around me, got all my kit off, gave me loads of food, drinks, and, and sort of slightly recovered. 
The worst was actually to come, actually. The, the worst part in the entire sort of summit phase was actually getting down from the South Coal down to Camp 2. It's 2,000 vertical metres of, of descending. Um, with all my empty oxygen cylinders, all the comms kit, I reckon I had probably at least 50 or 60 kilos on, on my back, um, which is a, a huge, amount of, huge amount of weight, and all the kit, which I was wearing as well. Got down to the bottom, lost all my toenails, hardly had any skin on my back. Uh, but absolutely delighted to see this guy who's got the infamous Chang, which basically, it's a drink which is banned in every other country apart from Nepal. Uh, God knows what's in it, but it tastes absolutely delicious, but absolutely broken. Um, got down to camp two, didn't really get much better than, than that really, in that um, I left early with one of my teammates, Dean, and, and to say we fell down the ice floor is an understatement. We, we were wasted. It, it was so dangerous. Um, fell down the ice fall and then, and then got down to base camp and that's when actually everything hit me. Up until that point, it had been a series of objectives and goals. Do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. Right, check, 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 check. Managed to do that, got on, sat on that rock and like, I was just overwhelmed with emotions really. It had been two and a half years of effort. All that danger, all the worry for my family and friends and all that sort of stuff, it just kind of, I, I hadn't, by that, at that point, I hadn't really had time to process what had just really kind of happened. Uh, albeit there's still a lot of work to do in terms of the campaigning, but it was a massive relief point. Um, and then uh, very excitingly, Skype basically paid um, for myself and one of my teammates to jump in a helicopter back to Kathmandu. That was pretty cool. That, that, was, that was pretty fun actually, but we actually had quite a few near misses on the way back where we like clipped trees and all sorts. They're Italian pilots, but uh, it genuinely was the most reflective hour of my life. Uh, I, I've, I've never been in such deep thought as in, in that helicopter ride. And just a few hours later, there I was randomly in Terminal 5 drinking like cappuccinos and carlichos with my, with my family. And 20 hours later, 20 hours previously, I was on Everest. Um, it was a really, really sort of strange and weird sensation to be removed from Everest so quickly and then be back into normality. Um, and then the next week I spent it speaking, I was, went on the BBC um, news channel and onto the One Show, did a load of work with my sponsors, uh, and then nothing. It was crazy. Um, 268 people were involved to, to run this campaign in terms of getting the video call. A huge number of people which I was interacting with on a daily basis, then all of a sudden, absolutely <laughs> radio silence. It was, it was actually very, very strange to have these relationships, then all of a sudden they were just kind of gone. Um, but one, one last uh, nice thing about the campaign, I guess, was that the Science Museum reached out to me. Uh, they have just been building a new information age gallery uh, and uh, all revolving around technology, and they were looking for a smartphone, basically, which had done something interesting. And obviously this is probably a pretty interesting smartphone. Uh, so all the, all the kit is now in the Science Museum archives and, and the phone is now in the Information Age Gallery. So, so I guess there's probably one last question you probably all want to ask. How much, or maybe you've Googled me, how much did I raise? And it absolutely pains me to tell you, £53,000. I, I literally can't believe it, even today. It, it, it kills me. Um, to have people like Stephen Fry, uh, tweeting about you. Richard Branson, I ran a campaign on his Facebook page, his personal Facebook page, company Facebook page, website, Twitter. His reach was millions of people. And I thought, well, if just 1% one, 1 of people donate a pound, it's going to be like 50, 60,000. Uh, and, it, and, it, and it just didn't happen. I, I, for some reason, I didn't get that critical mass. I didn't get enough people sharing my content. Um, and that really hurts because like on one side I've got this technical success but actually the, the technology was just a mechanism for me to hopefully raise the money. Um, so in my eyes actually the campaign was well, for me personally a massive failure and it's, it's, still, it's still really painful to talk about it now to you but um, it's one of those things. I know that 
I couldn't have put in any more energy into the campaign. To say I didn't rest for two and a half years is an absolute understatement. But um, it's been a pleasure to share it with uh, everyone here at Facebook. So uh, if you've got any questions, uh, far away. Yeah. Doesn't work. Oh yeah, it was 2013. Yeah, was so it was 19th of May 2013, okay. which um, I suppose is, is a reasonable amount of time away, but um, every time the every season comes, comes it, it feels like it was yesterday. The, the, the memories uh, which I have from it are completely ingrained. I feel like I could trace every step in my, if I close my eyes. I mean, it, it is such a powerful experience um, that, yeah, it really does feel like yesterday. And what would you have done differently if you did it this season or, say, 2018 season? Um, if I could, I would have increased my budget and I, and I would have had a dedicated team in, here in London pushing the social media aspect more. Because I, I actually took a guy with me to base camp um, with the idea of him being kind of a base camp manager for me. Um, but he, on day one of the trek, hurt himself and had to be Kazavak out. So I was left basically doing everything. And you know, a big problem on Everest is, is actually boredom. People, you, there's a lot of sitting around. Whereas I was, I was like the polar opposite. I was, I was manic, I, I, didn't, I didn't rest because I was basically trying to do what a social media team was doing. And also uh, where my sponsors like HCC were driving social media, but it was all about their content. It wasn't necessarily driving people to my website to donate. Um, so if I could change anything, it would be that. I would have had like a crack team here in London basically trying, trying to help me with that. Um, yeah, it was difficult. What happened with the other climber who wanted to make a video call that rushed past you at the end? So yeah, that's a good question. Um, so in the end, he didn't do it. He didn't actually have the kit with him. And um, yeah, I, I kind of, I, I, I talk about that um, in some of the other things I do in terms of you know that sort of corporate intelligence. Um, and, and that I was completely wrong. I just, I just assumed that he'd have the kit with him, but actually, but actually he didn't. So I was potentially risking myself, or not risking myself enough, because all, all the information I had was, was rubbish. I probably should have actually just gone up to him and said, you know, are you gonna, are you gonna go and do the video call? Maybe he would have told me, maybe he wouldn't have, but uh, yeah, no, so, so no, he, he didn't do it, so I was, so I was lucky. How many people did you have uh, on the mountain to support you on the team? So, like, how many people did you have climbing with you on? Uh, so, so in, in our team, um, Jagger Globe, which is one of the, co the company I went with, um, so they're really cool in that they're one of the founders in terms of like commercial climbing on Everest. Uh, there was there were ten climbers in our team, and and they they actually select the people they take, which is is actually really important because. Because I wanted to make sure that I had the right skill set to go and climb Everest safely. Because the, the day before I summited, um, some bad weather came in, and it was a classic example of why you need to be technically able to actually climb Everest on your own. Because there are unscrupulous companies, you pay them enough money, they'll literally just kind of drag you to the top. The bad weather came in, all the Sherpas just ran for the hills, and everyone was left on their own. So it would literally be you fighting for your, for your life. And, and if you don't have the right skills, then, then you're gonna die. Um, I think people forget about that. They, when you see that thing, something is achievable, and, and even for myself, when I was at the bottom of Hillary Step, I knew that someone had been up the top before. So that's kind of quite comforting. Um, and I think people look at Everest and go, right, well, 200 people summit each year, so you know, it can't be that difficult. But it, it's, the, it's the environment around you which is, it, which is, will really bite you if you're not careful. Uh, I still continue climbing right now. Say it? I continue climbing. Uh, I've sold all my high altitude mountaineering kit. So, um, and I, well, I, um, apart from that stuff, um, which is obviously all fully branded, no, I don't do any high altitude. I, I, do, I do some other small climbs of ice waterfalls up in Scotland, which, which actually is far more technical than Everest. There are far better climbs than Everest. And would I recommend anyone to go climb it? I would say probably no, actually, because I enjoyed the climbs before Everest more than I did Everest itself. Um, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of danger, and it's a lot of money. 
Um, you can get have just as much satisfaction from doing a bit of glaciers out in, out in the Alps and stuff like that with your friends. Yeah. Um, did you see like a lot of dead bodies or general like artifacts of previous expeditions? And just yeah, no, no. It, it, it's a good it's a good question, and it gets asked every time. Yeah, so I saw t I saw two dead bodies when I was there. There there are a lot of there are a lot more a lot more bodies because they they get kind of left. Um, The reason why I didn't see more is actually because you spend half the time climbing at night. Um, and the reason we climb at night is because it's a more stable environment to climb. There's, there's less, you know, the ice is li less likely to move. Um, so that in itself is, is almost like a bit of a comfort blanket because you can't really see how, how much you're exposing yourself, the risk, because you just got a, like a head torch and you're kind of a bit kind of focused. Um, but yeah, there are, there are a lot of dead bodies up there uh, without a doubt. And they, you know, you, the one, one of the, people I saw, you could see like weathered skin and all this sort of stuff, it was like leather. So nine people died when I climbed Everest. Um, so there's a very real danger there without a doubt. So you mentioned that the costs associated with the expeditions were, with the expedition were 20k in training and 50k in the expedition itself. How was the money distributed? What kind of training was it? Um, so the, so the, the, the training were, were, was all the climbs all the climbs which I did in the presentation, um, so Mont Blanc, uh, Aconcagua, Denali, um, Scotland. And it's very, very important for me that basically every single penny went to Comic Relief, which is why I basically bankrolled. I, I started up the business, if you want to call it that, um, because I wasn't in it for a free climb. I, you know, obviously, it's great to get to the top of Everest, but actually, it wasn't, it wasn't a lifelong dream for me. And then the 50,000 is, uh, is pretty much all costs so to, to actually go with the company, it's $53,000 to go with the company. Uh, they, they, they need all your specialist equipment, airfares, and all that sort of stuff as well. So, and, and I did pay for an extra person to come with me, uh, albeit he lasted one day. So, so that, was, that was not money well spent. Uh, and I kind of wish that I hadn't done it, but you know, it's one of those things, right? Uh, how many other people got to the summit the same day as you, and how many days a year are there where you can get to the summit? Sure. So um, about 80 people summited uh, when I did, uh, and it works out about 50-50 in that everyone has a Sherpa, so about 40, 40 clients, if you want to call that. Um, you're completely right in that basically there are, there are only certain windows when you can summit Everest, and that's because um, there's a jet stream which generally hovers around Everest, and jet streams are basically big movements of air of, of air which move very fast around the earth and they move from west to east. So ordinarily the wind speed up there is like 100 miles an hour. So you're waiting for that in-between season just before monsoon season for that to move forwards uh, and so in an, average, in an average climbing season it would be in May you might get perhaps seven to ten summit windows, seven to ten days where it's, you can summit. Um, but actually the year before when I went uh, and the reason why so many people went on the one day which I did is the fact that um, the year before, those summit windows didn't happen. And it got literally right to the very end of the season. It was looking like no one was going to summit. And then all of a sudden there was a set day around about May 29th. And you saw in the paper where there was like 200 climbers all in a line. I mean, it was ridiculous. Um, and unfortunately, that kind of nervous energy carried on into my year. Um, generally, what happens is that all the teams come together and then they, they kind of work it out between themselves to stop so many people being on, on the mountain. Um, but Jagger Glade went this year and they're the only team on the summit. So it's, it, you just don't know really. Um, but yeah, there's, there's only, you can summit in May, you can summit at the end of September, October. So basically before and after the monsoon season. You mentioned um, the reason why kind of you started doing this in the first place. Yeah. And then you kind of mentioned having kind of difficult times doing the climb. What was the thought or kind of what was it that actually you used to motivate yourself in that moment? Was it a different reason or was it still the same? It was letting, it was letting that kid down, actually, which I saw in the, in the bucket. And every, every time I was on my bike, I was like, I was, and it's easy to say that, but I, I genuinely mean that. Um, and, you know, I'd be out in Regent's Park in the middle of winter, pulling a tire, uh, listening to my music. And actually, I think, you know, there's a greater cause here. I 100% believe in what I was doing. Um, and, and that was it. It was just like, I'm, I don't want to let him down and the children I'm trying to help the money for. 
and, and I don't want to let everyone else down more than anything. It was, the, it was almost the fear of failure, if you can call it that. Um, and just, just sheer pig-headedness, I guess. But it was, yeah, it was, it was tough. I mean, there were a lot of times where, you know, I just wanted to give up. You know, that first year where literally 200 PDFs, in fact, it was more, just, over, more, just over 200. And you, like, after that amount of rejection, it's kind of hard to, go, to keep being optimistic. And I wish actually I thought about it before and trying to pivot the campaign and trying to think, well, perhaps, perhaps I'm doing something wrong here. Um, but yeah, it was just that kind of flash, flash moment where I thought, right, I need to do something else. And then if that doesn't work, then, well, we'll just have to see, see what happens. Did you or somebody on your team require any like special medication to cope with the lack of oxygen? Yeah, so um, you can you can take a drug called Diamox. Uh, I I never took Diamox, and with altitude, it's a funny thing in that um, there's no test which you or I can do here to determine whether you can or can't climb above 4,000 meters. There does seem to be this kind of invisible barrier around 4,000 meters. Just some people just can't do it. You could be the world's quickest ultramarathon athlete and not get above it, and you can chain smoke 80 a day, and you can get above it. I mean, there's just, it's, just, it's just one of, the, one of those things. Um, so a lot of people uh, take Diamox to kind of cheat your body, to make you acclimatize quicker. But the, the real downsides about that is that it dehydrates you even further, and it makes your fingers and toes go tingly, which is a really bad thing, because actually, uh, you need those senses to feel whether you're actually getting frostbite or not. Yeah, a lot of the time your hands get very, very cold anyway, so it's a really fine line to go, well, are my hands just really cold, or am I starting to get frostbite? Um, but any, any, thought, any sort of thing like that where I thought, actually, I'm depriving myself of senses, because my biggest fear on Everest was, was not actually losing my life, it was actually losing my fingers and my toes, something which would actually impact me afterwards. Sounds very selfish, but... You know, if you lose your life on Everest, then you don't have to deal with the fact you've lost three of your fingers. Um, it, it, it sounds mad to say that, um, but it's just, those sort of crazy thoughts go, in, go into your head. Um, you know, I was very, very nervous about frostbite, and in fact, I mean, I wore huge amounts of layers to the top. I deliberately ran a bit hot to make sure that I didn't get cold, which can go against you, because if you sweat too much, you can get cold if you stop. Um, but yeah, I deliberately ran hot to make sure that my core wasn't taking any way of my any any of my nice warm blood from my extremities, because that's when you get frostbite, when you get cold. Yeah. Okay. We're done. Thank you very Thank much. You. Cool. Thank you. Guys. Yeah, cheers. <laughs>